so good to be in the house of God today. And to all you uh, new, new friends this morning, we welcome y'all. Hope you come back to see us. Hope God blesses you during this service. This is our prayer book. This is a, not a book, it's a, it, it's just a, a prayer request type deal uh, where our names are written in here. For any kind of prayer we have, whether it be financial, health, salvation, uh, whatever your needs might be, it goes in this book as a petition. God said, let your, let your request be known by prayer and petition. So we pray for this book every time we, we, we have a meeting here in the church. When the doors are open, this book is prayed for. Names are written down as a petition. So for our, for our new friends here, if you, if you have, don't have your name in here, we, we uh, ask you to put your name in here or someone's name you're praying for in here before you leave today. Those online that are watching, you could uh, send Mr. Brother Woody a, a good address. Uh, for for him to return, and he will he will send you this decal that says Rockland Country Church is praying for me. It will be praying for whichever name you put in this book, whether it be your relatives, your friends, or your enemies, or whatever the situation might be. But this book is prayed for several times during the week. Every time the door is opened up, and it's also prayed at people's homes every day. Uh, my name's in here several times on several occasions for several reasons. I even have my dog's name in here, and I have my horse's name in here. So. Uh, God, God knows what you need doing where your heart is. And he said, we have not because we ask not. So this, this, this is going by his word. We're putting it on paper. We're praying about it. And we're asking for it. Let's all go to, go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, boldly, Lord. We just, we, just, we just thank you for all you've done for us in our lives, Lord. We thank you for every breath we take. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Lord, we just ask you, Lord, that, that you would look upon these names in this book, Lord, whatever the needs might be, that you would grant every request, Lord, according to our faith and according to our belief in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as you can tell, some of us have to wear many hats around here, right? So uh, if I can do it, you can do it. And we are looking for folks from the praise team. Chris and them are out. That's the reason Chris is not here. They're at an event with the uh, Trail Life group. And uh, they'll be back, uh, I think, tomorrow night some, or tonight sometime. Today's Sunday. Uh, I got a couple of announcements that I need to make real quickly. Uh, number one, you know our Christmas for Kids program through the other churches. We usually pay for the bicycles for the kids. Uh, which is generally around thirteen to fourteen hundred dollars, I believe, and uh, we're going to start collecting. I'm sure we're going to start collecting for that pretty soon, if you can. Uh, but as the Lord leads you, the meeting is tonight. The first meeting for Christmas for Kids. This is going to be a, a, a full-blown lot of palooza this time uh, because of COVID restrictions and such. We haven't been able to do it like we've done it in years past. Whereas we get the gym over at the junior high school. We all meet in the junior high school and we have uh, events for the kids and we have lots and lots of stuff for the families, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a big to do for the uh, the kids up here in uh, in the in the Kemp School District. These names are not submitted by, by parents. These names are submitted by the teachers of the schools up there because they know the kids who are in need. They know the kids who, who need help. And uh, so therefore we come together as the church and uh, we make a big deal out of it. And of course we try to supply them with their Christmas desires, if you will, including food provisions, all right? So it's gonna be a big deal this year, bigger than it has in the last two years because of COVID. Uh, so if you can volunteer to help, uh, if you wanna be at that meeting tonight, Terry and I are gonna be there at 6.30. It will be at the um, uh, Senior Citizen Center over in, uh, in Kemp. It's on Dallas Street and uh, it's at 6.30. So again, if you can be there, fine. If not, we will get uh, some information and we'll pass it along to you uh, next week or the weeks to come, all right? Uh, the other thing that I need to make an announcement of, most of y'all, this is what, for once, they're in my pocket. Imagine that. Uh, many of you guys uh, may know our brother. I know him as Motorcycle Mike. Mike, if you'll just raise your hand up, please, okay? That's Motorcycle Mike. He lost his mom yesterday. Uh, and so next Saturday at 11 o'clock, is that correct? 
Okay, next Saturday, 11 o'clock, we're going to have a memorial service here for his mom, all right? So if you want to join with that, that would be fine. Uh, I did ask him about a, because uh, he's going to have family and friends come in from out of town, and uh, I did ask him about uh, food provisions and such, and I just told him to get with us before we left today so that we can make sure we can take care of that. Uh, but anyway, that will be next Saturday here at the church at 11 o'clock, all right? If you can attend, please do so. Uh, the last thing that I have today is, is uh, put on your glasses. Yeah, Gigi. Uh, we went and saw Gigi yesterday, Gloria. Uh, she's supposed to be watching today. So hi, Glo Glenda, Glenda, I'm sorry. I, Gigi, that's what I know her as. So Gigi, if you're watching, God bless you. Love you. See you this afternoon with some pancakes, all right? She, uh, she likes pancakes from Huddle House, and so we're going to go and get her some pancakes today, her and her roommate, and we're going to take them to them. Uh, we bought the syrup yesterday, so we got sugar-free syrup, Gigi, and we're going to bring them to her today uh, around uh, this afternoon sometime. And, uh, but y'all keep her in your prayers. Uh, she's not doing well. She's not doing bad right now because we, uh, as of yesterday, we went and visited her with her yesterday, and she seems to be in pretty good spirits, very coherent and everything. But uh, anyway, she, uh, she's not doing well, all right? So I'll just leave it at that. So keep Gigi in your prayers, please, okay? Uh, other than that, we've got several kids here today, so uh, we're going to, yes, yes. Oh, thank you. See, there's so many things I need to know, and then they got me up here doing this other stuff, and I'm totally distracted. I had to ask. Uh, 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 Edie told me over there in the, uh, in the uh, kitchen there a while ago, she says, you need to remember to talk to this. I got in here, and I couldn't remember what she said. It's just, just swimming around in there. Them little marbles are just rolling around. But uh, now what am I supposed to talk about? Oh, Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, for those of you, and I need to know this, please, because Miss Terry is fixing to leave and go visit with her dad. Her dad is not doing bad again, but he's not doing well. Uh, he's 82, 83, 84. And uh, she's going to go and spend a month with him. She's leaving next Friday. She'll be back uh, the Friday after Thanksgiving. So what she and I normally do is we have, because we have our Thanksgiving that Saturday, we have Thanksgiving here at the church for people who don't have um families or someplace to go etc 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 so if you are interested in doing that and please don't let this deter you i'm not a cook all right so i'll buy whatever you need me to buy but if somebody would cook a turkey and some dressing if we're going to do it if we're going to do it, because I ain't a cook. Now, I'll order it from Brookshire's or wherever, you know, to get her done. But uh, I, I'm just not a cook, and I just don't do it. Uh, so uh, I, the only thing I make is reservations. So so if, uh, if you can help out with that and you want to be here, if you feel as though you need to be here or would like to be here that Thursday, Thanksgiving Day, please sign up the sign-up sheet. Uh, Edie's got it back there in the back. Please sign that up so that we know who's going to be here and what I need to get from Brookshire's uh, de delicatessen, all right? So, uh, no, I hope you, you will join me in that. If not, that's fine. Uh, I'll go spend it with my kids or something. But anyway, um, that's Thursday, Thanksgiving Day, all right? Please let me know. If you don't want to do it, that's cool, all right? But if you want to do it and you feel, uh, and you don't have any place to go, that's what it's for. It's not for us, it's for you. It's for whoever doesn't have, say, family and friends or a place to go or whatever. I'll buy you dinner, okay? I ain't going to cook it, but I'll buy it, all right? So with that, is that all I'm supposed to announce? <laughs> I hope so. I think so. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll dismiss our kids, all right? Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for each and every day, Lord. We thank you for the breath of life itself. We thank you, Lord, that you uh, supply all our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Father, be with us today and open up our minds, hearts, souls, and spirits to receive your word today as you would have us to receive it. Father, I ask you to use me and use Miss Terry and whomever else is teaching today. Use us as your tools and vessels to bring forth the word, which is Jesus Christ, which is God 
bring it into our lives, Lord, that it may manifest in our lives and we may go out and spread the gospel as you have called us to do. Father, I want you to, uh, I ask you to bless our tithes and our offerings today. I ask you to bless our country, I bless our administration that is, uh, you have appointed over us. I don't understand your ways sometimes, but as you appoint them over us, Lord, I ask you to be with them and guide and direct them, Lord. Bring them unto your, your wisdom and your knowledge. I ask you to uh, lift, or lift up all of our community to you, Lord, and all the churches that are teaching your word today. And all those who are not teaching your word today, Lord, as Kathy would say, to bring them to the understanding of the word, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we are here to preach Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's dismiss the kiddos. It is awful hot in here to me. I don't know about y'all. Are y'all hot, cold? Whew, I, got, uh, I got about two or three around here. All right, all right, thank you. I've lost two already, so I don't know. All right, as you notice on the board here, John 3 and 7, John 3, chapter 3, verse 7, and then a question mark. Well, guess what? We're not going to be in John 3, 7 today. Okay? That's what the question mark is for. But I want you to know what John 3 and 7 is. John 3 and 7 is, is that Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must, get this, you must be born again. You must be born again. Those are the words straight out of Jesus' mouth. Now, that's going to be very, very important because next week, next week, we're going to see what being born again truly is. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Don't raise your hands unless you're bold enough to. Who here thinks they are going to heaven because they have been baptized? Very good. Very good. All right, and the reason being is, as I'm going to explain to you today, baptism. There are five baptisms, baptisms mentioned in Scripture. Five. There are five baptisms mentioned in Scripture. What? I thought there were two. One in the water, one by the Spirit. I'm glad you think that, but there are five, and I'm going to show them to you, and we're going to explain them, and we're going to talk to them as much as Scripture reveals to us the information on a couple of them, because it's, there's hardly any information on a couple of them, and you'll see why whenever we get there. So we're going to talk about baptism, which is going to lead us to John chapter 3, verse 7, probably next week. There are many examples of baptism in Scripture given to us. First and foremost, Jesus himself was baptized. He was baptized in water. He was immersed into water. This is the water baptism, the first one that we're going to look at. The places in Scripture, if you want to write these down, where Jesus was baptized or immersed in water, it's in all four Gospels. It's in Matthew 3, 13 through 17. It is in Mark 1, 9 through 11. Luke 3, 21 through 22, and John 1, 29 through 24. We're going to look at today, to start off with, in Matthew 3, Matthew 3, starting at verse 13. So that's our first scripture for today. If you have your Bibles, please open them to Matthew 3, verse 13. If you need a Bible, if you'll raise your hands, we have Bibles. If anybody needs one, we'll be happy to give you one. All right. Matthew 3, starting at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him. 
saying, I need to baptize you. I need to be baptized by you. And you're coming to me. But Jesus answered him and says, permit it to be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice, one of the three times God spoke from heaven, a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom, in whom, inside of whom, very important to understand that, in whom I am well pleased. See, Jesus had not done anything as far as his ministry yet. Nothing. So he had not performed any miracle signs and wonders. He hasn't done any miraculous things. He hasn't healed anybody. He hasn't raised any dead. He hasn't done anything. That's why it's very important to understand that God said, in, in him, Inside of him, inside of this man, Jesus, because Jesus, though he was fully God, he was fully man. And God said, in this man, I am well pleased. Living in this man, I am well pleased. And he says exactly the same thing about you. Living in Woody, I am well pleased. Wow, can you imagine that? I can't. Sometimes I want to get out of me, right? Well, what about you? And we don't need any testimonies right now. But what, what, what would God, what do you think God thinks about living inside of your shell, your tent? I don't know why he would in mine, but he did. And he does. And he lives today inside of me. Because he says the same thing about all those who will come to believe. In you, I am well pleased. Living in you. John tells us in the, over the Gospel of John in 14, 15, 16, that Jesus and God will come and dwell, make their dwelling in us, inside of us. So it's very clear, Scripture says, God is in us. Very clear. Another example of a baptism by water is uh, the first Gentiles that were baptized over in Acts 10, 47. In Cornelius' house. We're not going to go there. But over in Acts 10, 47, Cornelius and his family, they were baptized by water. Philip baptized the Ethiopian in Acts 8, 38. Lydia was baptized after listening to Paul, Acts 16, 15. Water baptism we're talking about. Ananias baptized Paul. Baptized Paul. Acts 9 and 18. And of course, on and on and on, many other scriptures talk about the water baptism. So the water baptism is very important in our lives. It's very important in our Christian walk. The first one we want to look at is that water baptism. Baptism is from, the water baptism is from a Greek word, baptizo. B-A-P-T-I-Z-O, baptizo. It's a Greek word meaning to immerse. Immerse. It does not mean to sprinkle. It does not mean to pour. But to immerse as to go under. As to go under. Now some people think, oh yes, we go under the power of the Spirit. We're going to talk about that as well. But that is not what the water baptism does. The water baptism is simply your public proclamation or your public profession of what has already taken place inside of you. When God, in the form of the Holy Spirit, came and lived in you. In you. We call that regeneration. Some may think it is to go under a spell like condition, but it simply means to be totally enveloped by water, which is simply means hold your nose and get underneath the water. That's all it simply means. The Bible speaks of baptism in the usual sense of being submersed in water 
as our faithful witness to others. We do that as a faithful witness to others in hopes that they would say, wow, if Woody can be baptized, I can be baptized. If Woody can be baptized, anybody can be baptized. And that is very true. That is very true. Salvation is available to all who will believe. But also scripture speaks of four other, four other baptisms. I'm going to give them to you and I'm going to give you a reference to where they refer it. And then we're going to actually talk about them. The first is baptism by fire. Baptism by fire. Matthew 3 verses 11 and 12. The next one is baptism in or by or with the Holy Spirit. Baptism in or by or with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. The next one is baptism for the dead. Baptism for the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. And then there's another one that is called the baptism of the Hebrews into Moses. The baptism of the Hebrews into Moses. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 2. Now, that's the five baptisms. The water, the fire, the Holy Spirit, the dead, the, and the Hebrews baptized into Moses. So first, or secondly, we're going to talk about baptism by fire. We've already talked about baptism by water. Baptism by fire. You may see this. In Mark 1, 8, John 1, 33, Matthew 3, 11, and Luke 3, 16. And we're going to go to Luke 3, 16. You're at Matthew 3, now we're going to go to Luke 3. All right, Luke 3, verse 16. John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but the one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The Holy Spirit and fire. So, does that mean that he's going to burn us up? No. So, what does it mean to be baptized by the Holy Spirit and fire? Well, I'm glad you asked. John said the coming Messiah who would supersede him, who would baptize and supersede him, in other words, who is greater than he, for Jesus would baptize with the Spirit and fire. Now the water, the water baptism which Jesus was baptized in was simply a water that would cleanse the exterior temporarily. Like us, whenever we're baptized in the water, are we perfectly clean? Well, the outside is right then. And if you're really bad, I'll throw a bar of soap in there. We got some lawn, uh, Dawn dish detergent. We'll put that in there, stir it up, give you a bubble bath. If need be, but would you get dirty again? Well, sure. I, the work that I do, I work in construction. I come home every day, and, and it's like, ugh, get rid of them clothes. They need to go to the wash because I work in construction, and it's just what I do, and we get dirty rebuilding houses. It just happens, all right? So it's certainly not being baptized by the water that keeps us clean. So what keeps us clean? Well, first we need to understand who we are. And I've talked about this many, many times. We are a spirit being. 
we are a spirit being that possesses a soul and lives in a body. The body we can wash, but it's only temporary. The spirit must be purified and cleansed by the fire of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is an ever cleansing fire. It cleans that spirit man permanently, permanently. I've talked about this before. Your spirit man, once you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the spirit comes and lives in you. And your spirit man, the true you, the real you, which tells us over in Genesis 1 and 26, this true you is cleansed perfectly. First John, uh, I think it's, I don't know the chapter. It's over in the book of John, the first John, uh, John 1, 2, and 3. It's over in first John. I think it's in chapter 3 where it says that we, we sin no longer. Our spirit never sins again. Never. Now, we still got a soul and a body we got to deal with, right? But the spirit, man, is perfectly cleansed by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God cannot live amongst sin. So there is no sin in your spirit where God lives. Are we clear on that? I hope. There is none. But you still got a soul and you still got a rotten body you got to work on. I won't say you. I got one. But the spirit of fire cleanses your spirit perfectly. Perfectly. And permanently. And permanently. Number three. The baptism with or in the Holy Spirit. Now, I may ruffle a few feathers here, but I'm going to tell you what Scripture says. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to give you some Scripture so you can look it up. And I know that we have been taught through the years many different doctrine, what we think or what is claimed to be doctrinal things or doctrinal teachings. I don't listen to man. I listen to the Word, and I go to the Word, and I study the Word, and I understand, and I receive the Word, not man's interpretation of it. And I'm not trying to interpret anything. I'm going to simply show you what the Word says. You can ascertain what you want to believe. I'm not trying to change your beliefs. I'm not trying to change your thoughts. I'm not trying to change your desires or your wants or anything else. I'm just simply showing you what the Word says. Because the Word is true and every man a liar. So I believe in the Word and the Word alone. Three times in Scripture does Scripture speak about people speaking in tongues. Three times. You can look it up in Acts 2. Verse 1 through 13, which is the day of Pentecost. Acts 10, verse 44 through 48, which was at Cornelius' house. Acts 19, verse 6, when Paul baptized the disciples in Ephesus. All three times, all three times, when the Holy Spirit came, the accompanying accompanying I hope I said that right the accompanying of the Holy Spirit was a gift of tongues given to those who were baptized who received the Holy Spirit it was the gift that was given to these disciples and to these people who received their salvation, it came along with the Holy Spirit. But nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in Scripture does it say or proclaim that speaking in tongues is the, now catch this, is the only evidence is the only evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit. It does not say that. Because many, many people will tell you speaking in tongues is the evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit. 
Scripture does not say that. Find it and prove me wrong. It doesn't say it. The speaking in tongues is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit given to certain people for whatever reason as God apportions. I don't have it. I've prayed for it. I've desired it. I've wanted it. And I've asked God over and over and over. If this is what I'm supposed to do, if this is what I'm supposed to do, please give me that gift. I want every gift from God that I can possibly get. Everyone, every blessing I can get from God, I want it. Why would I not? Why would I not? If I had the, the gift of, of true healing like the disciples did, we'd close every hospital in this world. There would not be a hospital. There would not be a graveyard. But I ain't God. He has given me the gift of interpretation of the scriptures, I feel. And that's why I do what I do. The discernment of the scriptures, that's what I, that is my gift. That's what I do. That's what he's called me to do. I'm not saying I have any other gifts. Other than my wife, she's a gift. But I do not have the gift of tongues, nor have I ever felt compelled to speak in tongues. And I've even tried. I've had people say, oh, all you got to do is just, you know, start, start. If you look at the day of Pentecost, and you look at the other scriptures, it says that the tongues that they spoke were the languages that were known, that were known to the people who were hearing now, there is a speech or a, a language that the Holy Spirit speaks on your behalf to God. Clearly, Scripture tells us that. But as far as us, as far as the Scriptures, what we speak, what we speak is so that other people can understand of different languages and I'm not trying to, I know people are just caught up in speaking in, in this unknown tongue, if you will. And if you are, and that does you good, you know what? That's between you and God. It's not between, I'm not your judge. That's between you and God. And I'm not trying to judge. If that makes you feel closer to God, then I think it's a good thing. I do. But scripture does not support that. I mean, if you go over into the Acts where in the day of Pentecost, you actually see the languages that they spoke, the different countries of, of those languages that they spoke. It wasn't, and I hate to say it this way, but it wasn't a gibberish language. It was a known language. Now, again, if speaking in spiritual tongues, if you will, brings you closer to God, go for it. But I know that Paul tells us he says, I would rather speak one word of prophecy, one word of prophecy than a billion in tongues. One word of prophecy. What is prophecy? Prophecy is speaking the scriptures. That's all it is. You're not prophesying something that is, that is unknown. These people that come to you and say, oh, God gave me a new word for you. It's never known to man before. And God gave it to me to give to you. I'd say, well, keep it. <laughs> because as Paul tells, I mean, as uh, Solomon tells us, the smartest man ever lived. I don't understand that. 900 wives. Wait a minute. No way. But he's supposedly the smartest man ever, get, ever known. Because he told God, he says, look, just give me wisdom. I don't want riches. I don't want gold. I don't want every, I don't want all this stuff. You give me wisdom. Your wisdom, Lord. And God says, you're the smartest dude ever lived. And he said, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. In other words, there is no new prophecies. If there were new prophecies, the Bible is incomplete. And the Bible is not incomplete. The Bible is the whole word of God. And the word of God. And Jesus Christ. And Jesus ain't missing an arm or a leg or an eye or whatever. He is complete. The Bible is complete. Now, again, I'm not trying to discourage people at all. I'm just simply showing or telling you what Scripture says. All right? It, it, when your hand itches, does that mean money's coming? Is that what it means? 
I need lunch this afternoon. Nowhere in Scripture does it say speaking in tongues is the only evidence, the only evidence, and that's what a lot of people try to impress, the only evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit. But there are many instances where people receive the gifts of, of tongues in speaking in known languages. Jesus never said, never said anywhere in his speaking, anywhere in his writings, anywhere, because he, he inspired all of it, he had never said anywhere that you must speak in tongues. So if Jesus didn't say it, why does anybody else say it? That's just my point. I believe Jesus. And Jesus never says, in order to receive the Holy Spirit, you have to speak in tongues. He never did say that. Never where. Nowhere. It's not in there. Again, prove me wrong. However, Jesus teaches all those who believe will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. All that will believe will be baptized or will receive the Holy Spirit. Doesn't say that you got to speak in tongues in order to receive the Holy Spirit. He says, all who will believe will receive the Holy Spirit. Go to Romans 8, 9. I'm going to show you three scriptures. Romans 8, Romans 8, 9. And our Wednesday night Bible study saying, oh, well, we're going to study that here pretty soon. Well, you know the rate that I go, so probably in a couple of months we'll get to 8. Romans 8 and 9. 8 and 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So kind of think about that and kind of dissect it, if you will, and kind of reverse it a little bit. So if you do not have the Spirit, then you are not in Christ, and you do not have the Spirit, then you do not belong to God. So in other words, you are not saved. So flipping that around, if you please. So if you want to be saved, you must receive the Holy Spirit. And how do you receive the Holy Spirit? Through believing in Christ. You see how it works? I, I talk on this all the time, and I say it kind of nonchalantly, but if you do not have Jesus, you do not have the Holy Spirit. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, you do not have Jesus. If you do not have Jesus and the Holy Spirit, guess what? You do not have God. If you do not have God, guess what? You are not a child of God. Bam! Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Well, I mean, that's just, that's just plain doctrine. It's, it's not anything hard to understand. It's just plain and simple. You have to be saved. Oh, what is that? You have to be saved? Oh, well, it's not up there. Yeah, it is. Very top. You must be born again to be saved. Okay, 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 okay. What's born again? You got to come back next week. Sorry. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12, verse 13. First Corinthians 12, verse 13 says, now, let, watch this now. For by one spirit, we are all, all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, whether male or female, whether rich or poor, whether from even people from Oklahoma can be saved. Even people from Georgia can be saved. All can be saved. Whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into, into one spirit. Into one spirit. So we have to have the Holy Spirit in order to be saved. In order to be truly baptized. We can be baptized in water. 
but that only cleans the outside. Or basically, as we as Christians believe, it shows others what we've already had done on the inside. Let's go to Ephesians. This is one of my favorite scriptures. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, starting at, let's go ahead and start at 11. I have on my notes 13, but let's, I mean 12, but let's start at 11. Ephesians 1, verse 11, because I love this. In him. In who? In him. In Jesus. All right? Also, we have obtained an inheritance by predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. This is God is in control, man. Thank you, Lord. I'm so glad he is and I'm not. Verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. To the praise of Christ's glory. Why? Because we believe in him. In him, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. That's the purpose of our church, friend, is to share the word of truth out of the Bible. We don't make stuff up. We don't grab somebody else's interpretation. We don't try to uh, find a book that somebody, that everybody likes and say, oh, well, let's read this one because this will be good. No, we teach the Bible here and that's it. The word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is, oh, grab hold of this, guarantee of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, which is you. You are the purchased possession. Why? Because Christ paid for your debts. He died for you and he died for me. You and I are the purposed possessions of God. To the praise of his glory. To the praise of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for saving a wretch like me. There's a song there somewhere. Man, thank you, Jesus, for saving a wretch like me. I love that song. I, I don't know it real well, but Laurie sings it. and says, he knows my name. He knows my name. Edie sings one. It says, whenever he was on the cross, he looked ahead in time at me. When he was on the cross, he looked ahead of time at you. He knows your name. He knows every hair on your head. The Holy Spirit, once we receive our salvation, comes inside of, inside and lives inside of us. And we are sealed. This is the seal that God puts on it. God puts this seal on. No one can break that seal. If you read over in Revelation 5, where John is, is boo-hooing because no one is worthy to break the seals of God. And then the Lamb appears. That lamb is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one that can break the seals of God. No, no person can. So if that Holy Spirit is sealed in your heart, sealed in your very spirit, and a guarantee to your inheritance that no one can break except God himself. And God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus tells us, he says, those who come unto me, I will not, never turn away. All who come unto me, I shall never turn away. So, How's it, how are you going to lose your salvation, friend? If you have it. If you have it. See, there's the kicker. There's the kicker. We're going to talk about that too. I think next week. I don't, me I don't remember all my notes. I'm just trying to go down this God leads, amen? But you know that not every believer speaks in tongues. I just told you a while ago, I don't speak in tongues. I begged, I prayed, God, if I'm supposed to do this, please allow me to do it. Show me how to do it. Make it happen. But scripture says not every believer will speak in tongues. Oh, well, but it's a sign. It's the sign of the Holy Spirit. No, it is a sign that accompanies the Holy Spirit according to scripture. 
1 Corinthians 12. Go back to 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 29 through 31. 1 Corinthians 12, <clears throat> verse 29 through 31. Still hear some pages, so I'll wait just a second. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 29 through 31. Are all apostles, and he's speaking about all those who are saved, all those who are Christ. Are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Like I told you a while ago, if I had the gift of healing, we wouldn't have hospitals. I mean the true gift of healing, like the apostles, to where their shadow, their shadow touched somebody and they were healed. Wow, what a miracle, right? Sure, Jesus laid his hands on people. He raised people. Paul laid a, a prone on people and raised them from the dead, on and on and on. They had that true gift of life. Jesus called out to Lazarus. He said, hey, Lazarus, come out. Thank goodness he didn't say, hey, y'all, come out. Everybody in that cemetery would be popping up. But no, he spoke to Lazarus. Just like he speaks to us and says, Woody, Come out of your grave clothes. Come out of your sins. Because the wages of sin is death. Come out of your sins, Woody. And come unto me. And I shall give you rest. There's so much scripture that Paul talks about. That Jesus talks about. That the disciples talk about. That the apostles talk about. That the Bible talks about. About being alive in Christ. Not dead. Alive. Verse 29, all, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles. Verse 30, do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts? And yet I show you a more excellent way. What is the more excellent way he's talking about? The most excellent way is prophesying. Prophesying Christ. Not going out saying, oh, yes, I have a revelation. No, it's not what he's saying. He's saying, go out and share with others. This is how simple it is, my friends. Go out and share with others what Christ has done in your life. And then don't forget to tell them. And guess what? He will do it for you as well. He'll do it for you as well. The greatest gift, the greatest gift is to preach the gospel. Prophesy. Share what God has done in your life with someone else. You may be saving their very life and their soul from hell. Just by showing them what God's done for you. How simple can that be, friend? How simple can that be? Number four. Baptism of the dead. Now, I know we're fixing to go into Halloween. Friend, I do not promote Halloween at all. Not even a little bit. Now, I know it's a chance to get a lot of candy, and I like candy, especially if it's Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. Hint, hint, hint. I just thought I'd throw that out there in case you didn't catch it, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Okay? Actually, it's rated the number one candy in the United States, and I'm the number one fan. Just saying. No, my point is simply this, is that Halloween is a, is a celebration of the dead. It's to celebrate the dead. We love our, our families who have passed away. We, we grieve for them. Mike just lost his mom, and I'm so sorry. His heart breaks. My heart breaks for his heart breaking, okay? Uh, we just lost Sheila not too long ago. My heart breaks because we've, you know, Kathy's a great, great friend of hers, a real close friend of hers, and her heart was broken whenever Sheila died, though it was expected, and on and on and on and on. These things happen. Death is a part of life. Death is a part of life. But we have to understand that when people are deceased, I'll put it that way because I don't mean to be rude about it or abrupt about it, but when people are deceased, guess what? They're deceased. They're gone. 
We can mourn as long as we need to mourn. There's no problem with that. We can be sorrowful as long as we need to be sorrowful. But don't let it hinder your walk. Don't let it hinder your walk. Because if you are a true believer, we know, we call it a celebration of going home. We rejoice. Because they're now with Jesus and we're left here to deal with each other. I love you, but if I don't get Reese's peanut butter cuts, we're going to have problems. No. <laughs> Just kidding. I get a whole bunch of them every Christmas because my kids know that I absolutely do love them. As you can tell, right? But in baptism of the dead, it is spoken of in 1 Corinthians 15. You're in Corinthians, go to chapter 15, verse 29. Chapter 15, verse 29. Very short. This is not explained, but I can tell you basically what it talks about. All right, or what it, by studying, I can tell you the implication, okay? All right, verse 29, 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? Now, this is the only place in Scripture where it talks about being baptized for the dead. And the implication is simply this. There was a belief, and this is, this is never in Scripture anywhere. It is not spoken. There is, uh, uh, where are my notes? I, I, I'm getting off my notes, but let me just, I'm just going to forget my notes here and paraphrase exactly what I wrote down, what the Lord gave me. The baptism of the dead is for those of us who might think that our goodness can cause an effect on a dead person's salvation. Do we understand that? Okay, I'll explain it a little bit better. All right, I'm going to use, um, I'll use Terry and me. If I were to die, okay, and I were not saved, which I am, and I were not saved, then Terry would in an essence baptize or be baptized in hopes that her righteousness will affect my salvation after I'm dead, and it will not. It cannot. You and I must make a conscious decision to accept Christ before we die. After we are dead, guess what? We're dead. We're dead. We're dead forever, not only physically, but also spiritually. You are dead forever. That means you will go to hell. <gasps> it's not new. Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. I cannot save anyone who has already died. I cannot affect anyone's salvation if they're already dead. At all. No way, no how. Ain't going to happen. Each and every one of us, Scripture clearly tells us this. Each and every one of us shall stand before Christ. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Each, each and every one of us will give an account. Will give an account to Christ. Either at the great throne judgment seat or before the throne of God as a saved person. He will judge us on what we did with what we, he gave us to do. Woody, you missed four guys back in 1992, uh, I'm just going to say. What? How did I miss them? It's because you were eating a Reese's peanut butter cup. <laughs> I'm just using a hypothetical here. My point is, is that don't miss an opportunity to share Christ with anybody and everybody at all times. Because you never know when your few little words may change a life forever. May save someone. What? I can save someone? No. Understand this. You may change their thinking about learning who Christ is and them receiving Christ and he will save them. We don't save anybody. Jesus saves and only Jesus saves. 
So the people thought, the people of Corinth thought that maybe, maybe if they did some ritual things or some special things that would please God, then maybe God would, you know, lighten it up on some of the, their relatives that weren't saved. This is not true. It does not happen, it will not happen, and it cannot happen. So do not ever, ever, ever think in your mind that you can be good enough for somebody else because you can't. Each of us will face God on our own merits. Each and every one of us will face God on our own merits. Nowhere, nowhere in Scripture does it teach baptism of the dead. And it is contrary, it is totally, 100% contrary to the teachings of Jesus. Totally, 100%. So don't ever think that you can affect the salvation of a dead person. Because once that dead person has died, their choice is done. It's already been made. They cannot go back and be saved again. They cannot. All right, number five. Number five, the baptism into Moses. The baptism into Moses. You can find this in 1 Corinthians. If you want to go there, please do. I'm glad you wanted to go there. 1 Corinthians 10. Just a couple pages back, maybe. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 2. Starting at verse 1, though. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. This is speaking of their, uh, their over in the book of Exodus, coming out of, the, out of Egypt. About 2.5 million people came uh, under the cloud of God. During the day and the fire of God at night, he was always with them, always hanging over them, always hovering. And so they came through that. They also came, as we know, through the Red Sea. God parted the Red Sea and allowed the Hebrews to go through the Red Sea on dry ground, not muddy ground, on dry ground. All right. And then when the Egyptians came after them to try to, to overtake them, God destroyed the Egyptian army by making the walls of water, if you will. Who sent the Ten Commandments and, and seen, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Charlton Heston go, and the water's, you know, and all these people running across, you know. And then here come the Egyptians in the chariots after them, and then they're, ah! And the water comes down on top of them, and they're all swimming around. You've got to get out of here. And they all died. They all died. They're enemies of God. God is not going to let any harm come to his children and his people. God gave the laws of Moses to his chosen people. Why did he choose the Hebrew people? Because he chose the Hebrew people. Why didn't he choose the Amorites? Why didn't he uh, 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 choose the Hittites or the Malagnites or the Stagites or the Dynamites or whatever they are? Why didn't he, why didn't he, why didn't he do the, choose those people? No, he chose the Hebrew people because he chose the Hebrew people. That's all Scripture says. Abraham was a believer in different gods when God called him out of the Ur of Chaldees, which is a, today modern-day southern Iraq. God said, Abraham. He said, huh? Who's that? He says, I'm your God. And I want you to gather your family and you follow me. And Abraham says, yes, okay, and did. From that, we get all the way to Moses. And Moses receives the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. We know the story there. And then the people were still, uh, they refused to believe. And they refused to obey God. On and on and on and on. So God caused a lot of other calamities to happen. See, God is the judge. God can do what he wants to do to whomever he wants to do it. But God will take care of his children. Unless they're not his children. So are you his children? You want to be taken care of by God? I do. I do. 
in every way possible. That's why I said a while ago, I don't say I want his blessings because I want everything because I'm a glutton or anything like that. I say it because I want everything God has in store for me. I want everything God has in store for me. Everything. Why? Because I can use it to build his kingdom. And that is my total intent is to build his kingdom through whatever he teaches me or tells me to do. And I will use every ounce that I have in order to build his kingdom. But the Jews, the Hebrews, the Israelites, all the same people, they thought, well, we're God's chosen people. We're better than everybody else. Remember whenever Jesus confronted the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he says, woe to you. Woe to you. Seven times he says, woe to you. They are God's chosen people and they will forever be God's chosen people. There will always be Jews. Though the, throughout history the world has tried to destroy the Jews, it will never accomplish that. There will always be a remnant according to Scripture. Let's go to Galatians 3.19. Yeah, Galatians 3.19. It's right after 2 Corinthians. Galatians 3 and 19. Galatians 3 and 19. What purpose then it does, does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed, that would be Jesus, capital S there, should come to whom the promise was made. That is the Jewish people. Remember when Jesus says, I did not come to destroy the world, but to, to save the lost children of Israel. And it was appointed through and the angels by hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for only one, but God is one. It is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have come by the law. But the law does not give life. The law convicts us. But the scripture was confined all but the, the scripture has confined that all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Who believe. That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The Jews today still do not believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. Kept for the faith which would award which would afterward, I'm sorry, be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor in bringing us to Christ. What does a tutor do? A tutor teaches you, a tutor teaches you the things that you don't know. In other words, the law was given, as Paul tells us over in the book of Romans, the law was given so that we would know what sin it was. I used this in Wednesday night Bible study. Why did, uh, why was not uh, Cain uh, uh, why didn't he suffer because he murdered Abel? Because there was no law against murder then. The law had not been given. Why did uh, all these different guys have all these different wives? Because the law was not given then. There was no law. The law did not come until the, Moses went up on Mount Sinai and received it from God. We call it the Ten Commandments. The law shows us we need a savior because we all break the law. Therefore, the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ, not to chase us away. Oh, well, I think God ought to just relax a little bit and let me do what I want to do. Well, friend, let me tell you, where is that going to lead you? It's going to lead you to death is where it's going to, all right? That we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor. We are no longer under the law. Oh, stay with me now. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. No other way. No other way. John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father except through him, through Jesus Christ. For as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, nor neither slave nor free, 
There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. If you are Christ, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs, and heirs according to the promise. Amen. Everything Jesus has is available for you. Eternal life that Jesus has, he will never die again, is available to you and me through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. No other way. No other way. The act of the water baptism, which we do, and that's what we generally think baptism is. We think, well, I've been baptized 15 times. I'm clean. Well, if you've been baptized 15 times, you don't know what baptism is. You don't know. And I'm not trying to say that to, to inform you that you're... Uh, and by the way, ignorant is not a bad word. Ignorant simply means a lack of knowledge. It just simply means you don't have the knowledge. You don't know. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. You know, I, when I point, it's always three more back at me, right? Or actually six. But uh, we have to understand that if we get baptized over and over and baptized now over and over and over again in the water, we don't know what baptism is. I had a lady, I'm not going to mention any names. She's in her 80s now. Uh, she doesn't come here anymore. I don't think she even goes to church anymore for whatever reason, and that's okay. But at the time, she had told me that she had been in, in uh, church for like 67 years. 67 years. And she never knew what baptism really was. Shame on the church. Shame on the church. You must know what baptism is. And that's why we're talking about it today. If you think you, get to bab you have to be baptized over again, then that means you were never baptized and it means that you have not been baptized again because you don't know what it is. You're ignorant of the fact. Not trying to say that that's a bad thing. It simply means you don't know what it is. And again, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, okay? We must know what baptism truly is. And when we read through scriptures, when we talk to other people, everybody seems to think that is baptism. It's that tub, dunking in that tub. Well, if you've been dunked 15 times so far and it didn't take, what, the, what do you think this one's going to do? There's even a religion out here that says that unless you're baptized in our water, well, their water comes out of the same pipe that my water comes out of. It's just water. It's a public proclamation of what you've already done in here. In here. This is where the baptism happens. Not there. But the church doesn't seem to teach that. Because people are saying, well, I need to get baptized again. No, friend, understand this, please. You don't need to be baptized again if you are baptized. If you are baptized. Why? Because it's done in here. Now, if you want to rededicate yourself, then you come up here and let's pray for your rededication, which simply means, hey, this is a simple way of understanding it. God, I really messed up here, so uh, I know you, I'm still part of your kingdom, but, uh, you know, I, I just want to tell you, and I want to show everybody else that I want to rededicate my life to you, and I want to change my ways. It's not you that's failed, Lord. It's me, and I need to change that. And so, therefore, we do a rededication, which includes the water baptism. Why? Because people seem to understand that more than you simply saying, Lord, or Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. When you truly do that, and I say it every week, when you truly say that and mean it in your heart, the promise of Jesus is, is that he will come in and live within you. But you have to truly mean it. Oh, well, I got baptized because my friend told me to. Wrong. It doesn't happen. Well, I got baptized because my wife says, if you don't get baptized, I'm divorcing you. Hmm. No. No. No, no, no. I'm just teasing with that one. We simply say, I get baptized because I need Jesus. I need Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I need Jesus to be my Savior. Not to not to show anybody else, 
not to get to heaven. If you think you've been baptized in water and it's done and over with and that's all you did, you're not baptized, friend. You're not baptized. Because you can be baptized driving home this afternoon. You can be baptized working at your job Monday morning. You can be baptized in the middle of the night. God waking you up and said, buddy, I need you. I want you. I want you to come into me. And then you're surrendering to the Lord. You can be baptized right then and there. We're getting into next week. The water baptism is one of the two ordinances that Jesus left us with. We're almost through. Luke 22 and 19, Jesus says, you can write this down, you don't have to go there. Jesus said, this is the night before he was to be crucified. I love John, the Gospel of John, chapters 13 through 17. That's five chapters there that Jesus spent with his disciples. Moments, minutes, hours before he was going to go to the cross and die for all of us. He spent that time with his disciples, just his disciples, teaching them how to carry on his work. I love the Gospel of John. It's all about Jesus. After you understand Christianity, which is in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians teaches us in two different sections. Chapter 1, chapter 3 through 3 is the doctrine of our faith, the doctrine of our belief. Chapters 4 through chapter 6, there's only six chapters in Ephesians, is how we live that faith out. If you go to the book of Romans, 16, 16 chapters, man. 16 chapters of nothing but Jesus. 16 chapters of nothing but Christianity. 16 chapters of where we came from and why we do it. And on and on and on and on. That's why we're teaching the book of Romans. It is the best book a new beginner can, can take and read. And, and I suggest you start with Ephesians because it's short and it'll get you kind of tingling in your ears and your thoughts. You know, well, I want more. I want more. Then go to the book of, uh, of Romans and, and study. Study. Don't read. Study the book of Romans and then after you do that go to see who brought it all to you which is the gospel of John and that is about Jesus and I love the gospel of John I love that gospel because it tells me everything I need to know about Christ and how much not how much I love him but how much he loves me and it is such a comforting book but you got to know why it's all, what it's all based on. And it's based on Ephesians and Romans, okay? So start there. Anyway, John, I mean uh, Luke uh, 22. Uh, no, where am I at? I got to find it. I don't have it yet. Luke 22, 19. I don't have it yet. 22 and 19. Jesus, on the night before he died, he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave this saying... Now, now understand this, where I'm fixing to give you the two ordinances that Jesus tells us to do, or the two uh, commands Jesus tells us to do in remembrance of him. And it's when we do the Lord's Supper that we do these ordinances. But not just taking the elements, not partaking of the elements, but understanding why we are taking the elements, why we are partaking in the Lord's Supper. Verse 19, and he took the bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. This is my body given for you. In other words, dying for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's why we partake of the bread. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after the saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. The new covenant. Well, what's the new covenant? The covenant of grace. Not the law. Not the covenant of law that was made with Abraham over in chapter 15 of Genesis. But the covenant of grace which is simply God loves you in spite of you. Amen. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And behold, the hand of 
my betrayer is with me and on the table. That's not the part I want to read. Um, let's see. Well, maybe I should have done Matthew. Anyway, he... Maybe it's not... I thought it was in this one. Anyway, he basically gave thanks for the cup. He tells us over in uh, 1 Corinthians... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about this. This is one I use for uh, the Lord's Supper when we celebrate it. Uh, he takes the cup and he gives thanks and he says, partake of this and do this in remembrance of me. His life he gave for you, his blood he shed for you so that you would come to know him. Go to Romans 6, Romans 6, last scripture. Romans 6. Come on, fingers. Romans 6, verse 3. <clears throat> Romans 6, verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death. And that... Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. In the newness of life. That's a clue to next week. For if we have been united together in the likeness in his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with and that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For if he has died, has been freed from sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we, are also li that we also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died sin, for, to sin once for all. That the life that he lives, he lives to God, which is what we're supposed to do. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to the dead, indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, and that you should obey in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You are under grace. God's love. You are under God's love. You are no longer that person that you once were once you have been saved. You're no longer that person. Well, if I'm no longer that person, why in the world am I still messing up? Why am I still sinning? Because you got a soul and a body that needs a lot of work. That's how simple it is. We will, this is not an excuse. We will continue to sin all the way up in these bodies, all the way up until these bodies are regenerated. We get a new body. 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Timothy 4. There comes a day that all those who are dead in Christ will be raised up and those who are alive and walking in Christ, living in Christ, living as Christ, will be caught up with them in the air. And guess what? From that point on, you will never have to worry about sin again. But not until that time. Until that time, you got to do the test. You got to fight the battle. You got to just keep on keeping on. And it ain't easy, friend. Jesus says, in this world, you shall have trouble. Yeah, man. But he says, but I have overcome the world. And so if we're in him, we too 
can overcome the sin that is around us. We can. We can win. But you have to fight the battle. And it is tough. It's tough. There are certain sins in our lives that, uh, that, man, we struggle with every day. All of us, not just you, me too. We struggle with every day. And we think, man, why can't I just stop? It's because I have a sin nature. It's because I have a battle to fight. But what, did, what happens when we fight that battle and we win one day? And then we win the next day. And then we win the next day and the next day and the next day. Oh, shoot, this day I didn't win. But then we win the next day and the next day and the next day. Our faith strengthens because we know, well, I've won 10 times and I've only lost one. That means I'm going to try even harder to win even more. I think we need to turn the air off, Mike. I think everybody's freezing. I'm burning up. I <laughs> people cheering, and I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sweating here. But we, but we got to understand that we have to battle sin every day. I mean, there's not a day that's going to go by that you don't have an issue that you're going to have to, to, uh, to confront and try to overcome. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. It's just that simple. And you can either choose to stay here or you can get out. But don't get out. Don't get out. Why? Because God has works for you that he has predestined before the beginning of time. His good works that he wants you to accomplish. That's Ephesians 2 and 10. God wants you to be his warriors on this earth. Be his soldiers on this earth. Not Jesus, but be his Jesus on the earth. We are to be as he is. And we're not Jesus. There's only one Jesus. But we are to be as he is on this earth. And that's a tough shoe to fill. That's a tough shoe to fill. I fall short of it all the time. We just study this. There's no one worthy, no, not one. No one righteous, no, not one. And that's in uh, Romans 3. There's not. But it doesn't mean that we don't try. We have to keep fighting the battles. God will win the war. He will win the war. But we have to fight the battles. Some will lose. Some will win. But we can't stop fighting the battles. If there's a battle that you're fighting today and you want some help with it, we'll come alongside you and we'll pray for you. God is, the one, God is the power. The Holy Spirit is the power. God the Father is the power. Jesus is the power. Not us. We just come alongside you and agree with you and try to support you and help you and encourage you to fight the battle, the good battle of faith. And we'll be more than happy to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone today who does not know you, Lord, as Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, that they will receive you today. It is very simple to become a child of the Most High God. It's very, very difficult to live, it, live, live throughout life as a child of the Most High God. It is tough. It's hard. But you can fight the battle. So if there's anybody here today who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I pray that you will open up your heart, humble your heart, and receive him today. All you have to do is just simply say, but mean it in your heart. Truly mean it. Jesus. I know it's a rough road ahead. And your word even says that things will get even tougher once I accept you as Lord. But you are here with me and you'll never forsake me. You will walk with me and help me fight my battles. And we shall win over sin Jesus I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins wash me clean come into my heart come into my life be my Lord and be my Savior from this point on carry me with you throughout eternity in Jesus name we pray amen amen if 
that's you today and you've accepted Jesus Christ the first time for, as Lord and Savior, uh, I ask you to come up and let me know so that we can continue praying for you. If you have a battle that you're fighting, if you have a sickness or disease that you're trying to overcome, we're just people that will agree with you and pray for you. We don't do the healing. God does the healing, but we'll be more than happy to pray for you. So let's all stand.